All right, I got a lot of stuff to cover, so my watch says nine. Uh, good morning. How's everybody doing? Has this been, like, a fabulous conference or what? Yeah? yeah. I, I think Madison PM has done a fabulous job. Uh, my name is Jeff Thalhammer. Uh, some of you may know me from working on ProCritic, the module that everyone loves to hate. Uh, today we're going to be talking about dependency management with uh, Pinto, but I want to start off by maybe taking a quick poll. Uh, how many of you maintain an application that depends on a CPAN module? <laughs> good, good. I'm in the right place. Uh, how about five CPAN modules? How about 50? 100? Five hundred. <laughs> All right. So, a lot, right? Um, now, how many times have you gone to to build your dependency stack on a Monday, and then say on Wednesday you go to spin up a new virtual machine or a new developer comes on and you need to set up his development environment, and you go to build your dependency stack on Wednesday, and it it doesn't work. It breaks. Right? Tests fail. Uh, havoc ensues. Right? Has that ever happened to you? Or uh, have you ever, uh, has the team down the hall ever decided to upgrade Catalyst, which then upgrades Moose, which then upgrades on and on and on, and suddenly your application breaks, and you don't even use Catalyst? Has that ever happened to you? So these are the kinds of problems that I just sort of put under the general heading of dependency management. And... I, I would like to. I, I, I like to think that uh, a lot of shops have this. I think a lot of shops have it, and they don't even know it. So, Pinto is trying to address that problem. A little bit of backstory about where Pinto came from. You know, CPAN is is fabulous, right? There's tens of thousands of modules for every every purpose you can imagine. There's all these great services like CPAN testers and Anno CPAN and forums and ratings uh, and Best of all, there's this really good tool chain for building and testing and, and unwinding dependencies and all these sorts of things. But if you're using the CPAN and the tool chain uh, as a platform for building your application and you're really concerned about producing the, the same outcome over and over and over again, you want a predictable build, then the CPAN is, well, frustrating to, see the, to say the least. The, the root of the problem is that CPAN is not stable. Developers are constantly adding new modules to it. And you, you may not be aware of this, but they can actually remove them, too. Uh, and sometimes the things that get released are broken. Uh, just stuff happens. Uh, and, and the tool chain is all designed around uh, backward compatibility. It, it tends to favor going towards the latest version of things, and it just assumes that the author has maintained backward compatibility for you. So this has had some sort of some unintended consequences in the developer community. Uh, people tend to avoid dependencies because they're afraid of CPAN. It works on one day. It doesn't work on the next day. Or they avoid upgrades. Or we, instead of breaking things into small little bits, they just sort of throw everything into one giant site lib uh, and, and build these uh, monolithic systems. And I think the worst consequence of all this is you have these unreproducible environments. Uh, the sysadmin installs stuff in, in Sitelib, and if you ever wanted to recreate that in another environment, you have no idea what was actually there. So to combat the problem, people have come up with some different ways to deal with it. One strategy is to just, just sort of take your installed site lib and stash it in your VCS system. So, so we're going to take all of the built modules as they are, all the PM files, and copy them into SVN or Git or whatever. But, but this is pretty brittle. Uh, it, it's not portable. If you ever wanted to go and take your system to uh, a new operating system, say the boss says, you know, we're switching uh, Red Hat distros, you, you have no way to rebuild that environment because anything that was compiled or it has any sort of OS-specific switches in the build, uh, you, you can't rerun. Uh, you can't smoke test this. So if you change one part of it, if you change one of your dependencies, 
there's, there's no easy way to go back and, and retest all of the things that might have been affected by that dependency. And it's just generally hard, hard to evolve over time. A slightly better strategy, <coughs> excuse me, is to just take the, the tar GZs, the distros themselves from, the C, from CPAN and stash them in VCS. Now this is slightly less brittle. It, it, it's, it's a little bit, it's more portable because then you can at least run the CPAN installer on these tar balls and go through the whole build and test process uh, on a new operating system if you need to. But it's still kind of icky. So one solution that kind of came, uh, came about was, was the CPAN site and CPAN mini. Now, I don't know if this was actually what they were intended for, but they allow you to create snapshots of CPAN. So this sort of solved the stability problem. You could at least have an image of CPAN where you could fetch your distributions and you would always get the same thing every time. But this is still clunky because dealing with the entire CPAN in, uh, at once is, it's big. Even, even if you're just looking at the latest versions of the modules, it's still uh, several gigabytes of, of data. Or at the very least, it's several thousand distributions. So that is one trend that has happened. The use of CPAN sites, CPAN mini, private CPANs. Another trend that's been going on is I see more and more shops are writing their own internal code in the CPAN style. So instead of just throwing PM files over the wall, they're actually using module build and make maker to package their applications into CPAN style distributions and deploy them that way. You know, with the dependencies declared and all of that. Uh, this still makes this a lot of fun. I think that has really helped propel the trend. And CPAN minus makes the deployment dead simple. And so we have the proliferation of what Brian Foy has called the dark pans. All of these, C, these private C pans of, of internal uh, private distribution, uh, uh, of private modules. And so you start to see a lot of these dark pan tools emerge. So on top of C pan mini, now you have C pan mini inject, which allows you to squirt your own distributions into, into your C pan mini mirror. Um, my CPAN app, DPAN, CPAN dark, or pan, these all do that exact same thing. Now, I had used these tools in some different combinations like three times to build private CPANs for, for different clients. And I, they always required some hackery, some, some shell script to automate uh, tying into VCS, or uh, and I was just never really happy with the results. So last summer, I had a client who wanted to build another one. And they, they were very uh, progressive-minded and, and, and generous and gave me an opportunity to start from scratch. And so Pinto is, is the result of that. In case you're wondering, that's a, that's a mare giving birth to a, to a foal. <laughs> All right, so, so, so what is Pinto? And I'm still sort of searching for, for, the, for the best one-word uh, description or one-sentence description of it. But it's an extensible tool for managing dependencies via a CPAN-like repository. So I think the best way to understand it is to walk through some use cases. And for all of these use cases, this is the basic context. Suppose you have an application called My App. There's one package in it called My colon colon app. And that application has one dependency. It depends on URI. And at the moment that you're doing this, the latest version on CPAN is 1.59. All right, so you got that in your head? So the first step with Pinto is to just create the repository. And we do that with the init command. It takes an argument. The, 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 the argument is a, uh, a, a path to the repository. In this case, I'm going to put it in a directory called my pan inside my home directory. And as I said before, the, the init is the command. And then what you end up with is something that looks like this. Uh, how many of you have actually looked inside of a CPAN to see what's there? A lot of you have. So this is what CPAN might have looked like on day zero, all right? Um, it's just a couple of folders and a couple of files, nothing more than that. And this is, this is sort of the genius of CPAN is in its simplicity. So now we have our own CPAN. Uh, the next logical question is what the heck is in it? So to do that, there's a list command. And again, the, 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 the key argument here is the, the path to 
your cpan repository. And when we fire that command, we get nothing, because there's nothing in the repository yet. But we're going to be using this list command quite a lot. Uh, a little diversion. Basically, every Pinto command takes, requires this root uh, uh, path to your repository. So you can shortcut that with a dash R. Or if you set the Pinto repository root environment variable, then you can just omit it entirely. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to leave it out just so you don't have to deal with the visual clutter of it. Assume that we have set this environment variable. All right, so we said earlier that our, our application depends on URI. So now we need to fetch the dependencies. We, we want to fetch that dependency into our repository. To do that, we use the pull command and just tell it we want URI. Now, Pinto is going to go out to the public CPAN, fetch whatever is the latest at that time, and pull it into your repository. So let's see what we actually got. Again, we're going to use the Pinto list command. And now you see a listing of packages and distributions. It looks a lot like the O2 packages file, if you ever looked inside of one of those. Uh, see, we have URI, and we have all the other packages that are also in the URI distribution. If URI had dependencies, those would also be here. Pinto will recursively go down and fetch all of the dependencies necessary to, to satisfy your request. So let's look at the listing a little bit closer. The first letter there is an R. So that indicates that Pinto thinks this is a release distribution as opposed to a development one. That's determined by some, uh, the formatting of, of your distribution name. If it, it has an underscore and some numbers or trial or RC or something like that, uh, that, that usually signals that it's a, a, a developer distribution. The second, the second letter, F, means it's a foreign distribution. It's something that you got from somewhere else, not something that you produced locally. Uh, if, if it were something you made locally, it would be an L instead. And we have the package name, the version number, the distribution's author ID, which is a uh, Giesel, and uh, the distribution archive. So, so now we've got our, our repository, we've got URI in it, and we've also got any prerequisites that URI has. We can add our own distribution to the repository. So we've taken my app and we've built it into a tarball using module build or, or distilla or make maker, you know, whatever your build tool is, you've put it into a tar GZ, and you can simply add it to your repository using the add command and then specifying the path to wherever your distribution archive is. Now when we do a listing again, you just notice that the first entry here is the package from my app. So Pinto has behaved just as pause would Looked inside your pack, looked inside your distribution, figured out what all your packages are, and indexed them uh, alongside URI and all of your dependencies. So now we've got a repository that has our application and all of its prerequisites in it, and now the fun starts. So we can install this with CPAN uh, just by setting the URL list and pointing it to the location of our repository and then install as normal. And every time we do this now, we will get the exact same result. Right? No matter what happens on, on the public CPAN, we will always get version 1.0 of my app and version 1.59 of URI. So this is important to me. And, and uh, I think a lot of people take it for granted that things just kind of magically work out on CPAN a lot of the time. But when they don't, it's, it's a real nightmare. Uh, you can also install with CPAN minus. Uh, the, cement, uh, the switches are a little bit different. Here you set the mirror option to, again, point to the location of your repository. And this one's kind of, kind of important. The mirror only option directs CPANM to not fall back to a public CPAN for any dependencies that it can't find on your own repository. Because that's exactly what we don't want. We don't want to go out into the wild and fetch things that in our, from the public CPAN, which might be in some unknown state. Easiest of all, you can just ask Pinto to install it for you. And this actually is just a, a, a thin wrapper around CPAN minus. So it saves you a little bit of typing. All right, so the next thing that happens, time passes, a new version of URI has come out on CPAN. It's got some new whiz-bang features. 
we would like to upgrade our, our uh, application to use it. So again, we can just use the pull command, but this time we're going to specify the minimum version that we want URI to be. If, if we had just asked for any version of URI, it would say, well, we've already got one in your repository. There's nothing more to do. But by specifying the minimum version, 1.60, which is now the latest version on CPAN, it'll go out and start looking for that version or newer. All right, so giving a, do a listing again. Now you see we've got my application 1.0 and URI 1.60. So, so far in this, in this, uh, in this uh, situation, we've treated the repository as sort of this singular resource. Um, there's only one version of, of the dependencies in it. But if you have multiple teams using this repository, or uh, multiple projects that depend on these res on, on, the, on the modules in this repository. This is bad, right? It's, my changes are now going to affect everyone else that is, that is using this, this uh, repository for their dependencies. And, and that's bad. This is exactly why we have branches in version control. So I can kind of make my own little sandbox and make a mess without affecting everyone else. The Pinto has the same idea, but they're called stacks. So what, what is the stack exactly? It's, it's a mapping, it's a named mapping from packages to distribution archives. Conceptually, it's equivalent to the O2 packages file. Uh, in, in a CPAN, there's usually only one stack, one O2 packages file, and it, it usually maps the latest version of, of all the packages it knows about to the archives that contain them. But with Pinto, you can have an arbitrary number of stacks and they can contain an arbitrary combination of packages. Uh, one, thing to know, one more thing to keep in your head about stacks. Every Pinto repository comes with a built-in stack called init. Um, initially, it is the, the default stack for all operations. Most of the commands you see, they all take a stack operation. But if you don't, uh, I mean a stack argument. But if you don't specify one, it defaults to whatever has been noted as, as the default stack. Uh, and you can change the default stack if you want. But just, just, just bear in mind that when you see init up here, that's a stack that's, that Pinto made for you when we first created the repository. All right. So let's go through that example again, um, but this time we're going to do it on a stack. There's two ways to make a stack. One is to just use the new command, and you give the stack a name. We're, just, we're, we're upgrading URI, so we'll just call the stack upgrades. But we already have a stack, the init stack, which already contains all of our dependencies on it. So it might be we have my app, we have URI, and then we have whatever else uh, our, our application might depend on. So another way to create a stack is with the copy command. It basically just takes one stack and makes a, a perfect mirror of it. And we just name the stack we want to copy from to the stack that we want to copy to. Now, when we want to upgrade on a stack, it's the same process as before. We just use the pull command, but this time we specify which stack we actually want this upgrade to happen on. And just as before, we specify a name and, this, and the minimum package version. Let's say that a little bit of time has passed since the last time we did this upgrade. Uh, so now we're now looking for uh, URI 1.62. So we can also look at the listing for a particular stack just by specifying the stack option again and, and the name of the stack we want to look at. And when we do that, you'll see now we've got my app 1.0 and URI 162. So to prove that I didn't actually just blow away the old stack, we can, we can look across stacks by specifying the at sign as a special stack name. And what that means is show me things across stacks, not just within a single stack. And I'm going to filter the results a little bit with the uh, dash P option here. I just want to see pack the, the listing, uh, listing results that just match the package name URI. And so the output is a little bit different now. Now we've got, in the second column here, we've got the name of the stack 
and then the rest of the listing as usual. And you can see we've got 160 in the init stack and 162 in the upgrade stack. So now I've got two separate stacks of dependencies that I can try and build my application from, one that uses URI 162 and one that uses 160. So to install, when you have a stack and you want to install from it, uh, again, you can use Pinto install, and you just specify which stack you want your dependencies to be coming from. Now, you cannot use CPAN and CPANM with stacks in quite the same way, but there is a workaround, and I'll come back to that later. All right, so let's say we've, we've built, we've, we've upgraded uh, URI to 162 on this upgrade stack. We've built our application, run our tests. All is well. Everything passes great. We now want to push those changes back into the main stack. And again, it's a lot like a VCS system. We can use the merge command to merge, every, merge all the dependencies that are on the upgrade stack back into the init stack. So this is equivalent to uh, doing like a, a, get, uh, a get push. And, oh, oops. So when we get the listing again after the merge, we now have version 1.62 in both the init and the upgrades stack. And at that point, you can throw away the, the, uh, the upgrade stack. It's, it's like a branch. You do some work. If it all goes well, you merge it back in, and then you throw it away. So hopefully you're thinking about po possible uses for these stacks, but here are some suggestions. One is just for handling upgrades, just like, like we just did. Another possibility is to have uh, stacks for different features. So you might have a, a long-running development branch to, to, to add a particular feature to your product, and you want to, to, you're going to add new dependencies as you develop on that. So you might have a, a stack just for that feature. Or you might have different stacks for different stages of development, like dev, QA, and prod. If you're, multi if you're developing multiple products uh, that have uh, different, uh, you could have different sets of uh, different stacks for each of them. Or if you ship a product to different, uh, different customers, and those customers might be using different versions of Perl, you could have different stacks for each of those. Question. I'll come back to that. All right, so, so I, think, I think stacks are really cool. This has been kind of one of the uh, criticisms I've seen of the CPAN model is that there is, there is an, there's a one-to-one -one association between a CPAN repository and an index. Pinto breaks that down, and now you can have a, a single repository with potentially many indexes. Another really cool idea, which I got from Ricardo, is the, is the idea of, of pinning. So what a pin does is it, is it fixes a, a particular version of a package to the index so that it can't ever be changed unless you unpin it. So to do that, we use the pin command, and we specify the package name that we want to pin. When we do a listing, we've got these little extra pluses here which indicate that the package is pinned. Now notice that I only asked to pin the URI package, but it actually has pinned every other package that was in the same distribution with it. And the reason for this is you don't want to get into a situation where, you know, part of your, the index contains part of one distribution, but another distribution might come along that, had, that, that shares one of these packages. And so it's, part, it's only partially pinned, so to speak. Just that one. Ah, so, so the question was, uh, does, does it pin the entire dependency tree or, or just the, the top node that I've, that I've requested here? And the answer is it only pins, pins the top, uh, the, the, uh, the requested package or the, the distribution that contains the requested package. So in this simple case, this, this doesn't seem all that interesting because, well, you know, if, if I don't want to upgrade, I just don't put the new version in the repository. But it starts to get a little more interesting when you think about 
suppose you want to add Catalyst to your, to your application. And Catalyst requires PLAC uh, 099. And plaque, requ uh, plaque requires HTTP request 603, and HTTP request requires something else, and then maybe seven levels down, something requires URI 162. So if we have pinned URI and we go to install Catalyst, and this time I'll, I'll throw on the dash V switch so we, we see a little bit more output. So you see Pinto goes through and starts pulling Catalyst, and then CGI Simple is one of its prerequisites. And then eventually it gets down to Plaque and Devel Stack Trace, HTTP message, and then finally it gets to URI, and boom, can install URI 162 because it's pinned to version 159. And at this point, Pinto stops, the whole transaction is canceled, and, and the, the database goes back to its original state. So it's basically saying you cannot upgrade, you cannot have Catalyst. You need to fix whatever is wrong with your code or fix whatever is wrong with URI so that it can be upgraded. So why, why do you want to do this? You want to prevent other developers from, from, from upgrading uh, dependencies that, that are not compatible with your application. And you want to prevent other dependencies from indirectly upgrading those things that you're not compatible with. So you can use pins and stacks in combination. Uh, probably the most interesting use case, is, uh, the most common use case is the one we just talked about where you, where you experiment with upgrades. So suppose you have a, a production stack that has DBI class 1.6. Um, we'll make a copy of it, call it test. We'll upgrade to 1.7 on the stack, build and test our application. If, if the test fails, we're going to go back to the prod stack and pin DBIX class as a way of, of signaling to ourselves and to all the rest of the team that this can't be upgraded until someone fixes it. <clears throat> Another use case for, for pins is when you make a local patch. Sometimes you get a, you, you're using a CPAN distribution and it's got bugs. And maybe you've sent a, get, uh, a pull request or sent in a patch, and for whatever reason the author can't or, or won't make a new release. So you go ahead and make a local patch of your own. Uh, for example, let's, let's, use, let's use plaque. Uh, you patch plaque and you repackage it as a plaque 98 underscore 01. And now you can add that to your CPAN repository <clears throat> just like you added your own application uh, tarball. And let's say we'll put that into the prod stack and then we're going to pin it because we don't want to be getting, we don't want to be accidentally be getting a new version of plaque from Miyagawa until we know that he has taken our patch or fixed whatever problem we found. And then when, when he eventually does, or, or one of his, his minions eventually does fix the, the bug, then we can go ahead and unpin it and, and, uh, and upgrade when we want, when, whenever we want. Okay. So the example we've been talking about is a little bit contrived uh, because this, this, we already have this application uh, built for us. It's, it's only, uh, it only has one dependency. Um, in the real world, you probably already have an application. And if you wanted to start using Pinto, you need to find a way to get all of your existing dependencies into it. Um, and a lot of times we don't know what those dependencies are because they've, they've evolved over time. Uh, Tim Bunce has put together a kind of a really interesting tool called Disk Surveyor, which will actually look through your ad ink and then through a bunch of meta CPAN API calls, will somehow figure out exactly which distributions got installed to create your Perl environment. And from that, it can give you a list of what you need to put in your repository. Stash that in a text file and then feed the dependencies into Pinto. And that's actually you know, pretty simple. Just use the pull, op, pull command again and feed in your, your list of dependencies uh, in this text file here. The only additional thing to think about is the no recurse option. Normally, Pinto goes through each dependency that you, uh, that you pull and, and it, and it uh, recurses into its dependencies and so forth. But we don't, in this situation, you don't want to do that. You want to pull in exactly what this surveyor found for you and nothing more. Uh, if you're using Dezilla for your application, uh, Pinto plays pretty nicely with that too. So you could ask, ask uh, Dezilla to list your dependencies 
You just pipe that into Pinto and away you go. Same thing for author dependencies. Um, now, I don't know about you, but when I go to work on something, I usually don't know what my dependencies are ahead of time. It's sort of a discovery process for me. Um, I might install, if I'm looking for web frameworks, I might install half a dozen different things before I actually settle on, on what I'm going to go, what I'm going to use. And, and this process might take several days or even weeks, maybe. And, and by the time I decide, what's on CPAN might have changed. So there's this hole in the development process from the moment that I, that I choose to install an application from the moment that I decide that, okay, this is what I actually, I'm sorry, from the moment that I install a dependency to the moment that I decide this is actually what I want in my repository. So Pinto can help install, uh, solve that problem by, again, we use the install command, and I'm going to throw on an extra uh, local lib option here. So I'm, I'm building all of this in my sandbox. Again, this is just a wrapper around cpanm. So this is equivalent to the, the dash local lib option on cpanm. And let's say I'm going to install Catalyst. And I add the, the really awesome pull flag. And so what that will do is it will install it for me. Uh, well, first, if it doesn't have it, it will go out to the public cpan and get it and all of its prerequisites. If if those prerequisites don't violate any of the pins that I already have set in my repository, if I'm basically allowed to, up, to install Catalyst, then it goes forward and actually installs everything into my local lib. So Pinto is sort of sitting in between me and the public CPAN and intercepting everything that I try to install. That's correct. So the question is, you know, would you do this on, 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 on a private stack or, uh, or, or the main stack? Uh, and I guess the real answer is it depends on how you're using stacks. Um, but, yeah, that would probably be the same way to go about this. All right, so there are some gotchas with Pinto. Uh, Pinto does not promise to index exactly like PAWS. Uh, PAWS is this really thorny uh, code base that has evolved over many, many years. And it has developed some pretty sophisticated heuristics for figuring out how to index a package. Um, Ricardo's been trying very hard lately to, to kind of bring that into uh, some kind of reusable module. Um, and I, I wish him well <laughs> with that. But, but Pinto tries to be just good enough when it comes to indexing your distribution. Uh, so it's not, it may not work for really old distributions or, or, or anything that's uh, been oddly packaged. Uh, PAWS also has a, a system of enforcing permissions, and Pinto doesn't have anything like that. So basically any author can deploy or can, can inject any distribution that they want. Uh, we, we, we trust that uh, you're all adults, and if you, if you step on each other, you'll, you'll sort it out yourself. Uh, and Pinto is strict about version numbers. Basically, if, if you try to squirt something in with a version number that uh, version PM can't parse, then you're host. You have to, uh, you have to fix that. So I think Pinto gets really interesting when you start using it in a team environment. And the, the easiest way to set it up for a team is to just deploy it on some local, uh, uh, some, some shared storage area. Remember, it's, it's just a bunch of files in a directory. Uh, the performance might suck on NFS, uh, but this is really easy to set up. Uh, the only downside maybe is that you have sort of the usual problems whenever you have uh, people using shared, uh, the usual permission problems whenever you have people trying to access uh, shared files. You have to think about like whether or not they're in the right groups and whether sticky bits are set and things like that. Uh, a slightly, a, a little more sophisticated way to do it is to set up Pinto D, which is a which is a web service that sits on top of a Pinto repository. So you put that on a remote host, and then you can run Pinto on Pinto commands on a local host. Uh, this allows you to utilize fast local storage on the remote host, and you can use HTTP HTTP authentication uh, as an extra sort of security layer if you want to restrict who can who can talk to your repository. I'm not going to talk about Pinto D too much because it's broken right now. Um, 
But this is what it would look like. Uh, on your remote host, you'll run Pinto init uh, and create a repository in some location, probably in, in a privileged location. Uh, and then, probably as a privileged user, you'll run Pinto D and you point that at wherever your repository is. And so now you have a PSGI uh, service uh, sitting on top of your Pinto repository. And then on your local hosts, whether that's your development machines or your desktops or whatever, you can run Pinto just like before, except instead of specifying the root as, oops, except instead of specifying the root as a path to a local directory, you just specify it as a URL to whatever host is, is running Pinto D. And you can run all the same commands uh, over, over the wire that you could do locally. Uh, now, I said earlier that you couldn't use uh, CPAN and CPANM to install things from stacks, but if you use Pinto D, you can. Pinto D actually serves as the, uh, as the, as the back end, as, as the web server for the CPAN itself. So it actually will serve up the distributions and the O2 index file uh, in addition to running commands for Pinto. So, so this would look something like that with CPAN. We just point the URL list to our remote host, and we tack on the stack name at the end of the URL. So this means to install stuff from the dev stack on the remote host, from the remote host. Same thing with cpanm, just, just append the stack name to the URL of, uh, your, of the repository. Uh, or you can, you can do it with Pinto as well. All right, so uh, Pinto Networks. Um, CPAN has, one of the reasons CPAN has succeeded is because it is, it is singular, it is centralized. There is exactly one place to go to get everything Perl. Um, other communities have, have only recently sort of caught on to the, to the virtue of that. Um, I would kind of argue that CPAN has also failed uh, because it is centralized. The code base itself is kind of arcane, and um, it has taken a long time, I think, for the community to realize the benefit of, of using a private CPAN like this, partly because it was just this pause was this thing that, that, that one guy seemed to own and, and nobody else thought much about it. So Pinto tries to sort of be centralized or distributed. So for example, you might have an organization with three teams and teams one and three might be pulling distributions from the public CPAN. Team two could be fetching di the distributions from either of them. And, and team one and three might also be sharing uh, uh, distributions with each other. So this might not actually be a good, good idea. Uh, the, the reason is there's no obvious way to, to resolve namespace conflicts. If, if two teams both make a package called foo, well, how do I know which one is, is the real foo? Um, we'll just kind of, the way, the way that it resolves that now is it's, it's sort of like a path-oriented thing. Whoever comes first, uh, you, you can order the list of upstream repositories, and whoever comes first is the one who wins. Uh, we'll have to wait and see if this actually works out. When I first started talking about Pinto on Perlmonks, some guys said, well, why, why, the, why the heck would I want a new packaging you know, a new dependency management framework, right? I've got uh, Debian packages or RPMs and things like that. And I don't really know much about those kinds of uh, OS packaging systems. But I'd, I'd like to think that Pinto can cooperate with them, that you can use Pinto to build all of the Perl bits of your application into one big wad, and then you can use your OS packaging system to link that wad up with databases or, or web servers or whatever non-Perl assets you need to deploy your application. Uh, Pinto a Pinto repository cooperates or ought to cooperate pretty well with uh, other tools because it, it is just a CPAN repository. It's just, just a pile of files and directories. So things like Anno CPAN and, and Meta CPAN, they, they should all just work. Uh, Pinto is not the only pony in this race. Uh, Miyagawa has uh, created this, uh, has created Carton, which is 
so it's trying to solve this, the same sort of problem, uh, but with a slightly different angle. It's, it's inspired heavily by uh, Bundler uh, from, from the Ruby camp. Uh, and if you compare the two side by side, uh, Carton is, is lightweight. Pinto is most certainly not. It is, it is fat. There are, if, it has over 200 dependencies on its own. So if, uh, if, if you're going to add that to your stack, then... Uh, uh, and and I'm, I'm not ashamed of that at all, really. Um, the other thing I really like about Pinto is that it, it's all file-oriented, so it's, v, it's VCS friendly. Um, so it's, it's, it's natural to you. Did I say Pinto? Carton is VCS friendly because it's all file-oriented. So you can use, it's designed to be used within your, your VCS workflow, and so you can just branch it and merge it just like you would any other thing in your, in your uh, source code repository. Um, Pinto, uh, Carton really doesn't support, uh, have a model for dealing with local patches. So when you have to fix someone else's distribution and you want to squirt that into your repository, it doesn't, doesn't really have a, a, a strategy for that. Uh, there's also only one stack, so to speak, in a, in a, uh, in a Carton repository. Um, and Carton seems very, Carton is ideal for if your application consists of basically like one distribution. Um, Pinto is, is a little more industrial strength, so it supports situations where you might have, your, your, your application might consist of many distributions that you build in-house. And you might want to be combining those distributions into, into several different products. Uh, a few odds and ends. Uh, I, I'm, a I'm becoming a big fan of Dissilla these days. So there's a release stage plugin out there that will ship your distribution to a Pinto repository. Uh, there's also this uh, experimental thing uh, I've, I'm calling Dissilla Chef, but uh, provides some additional uh, Dissilla uh, commands to build your, build your repository and smoke test your entire stack of dependencies sort of right, naturally right inside your Dissilla workflow. All right, a uh, quick word on Pinto architecture. Uh, this is all subject to change. Um, Pinto is, is, is extendable in theory. Uh, it hasn't actually been done in practice yet. Uh, but uh, it's, each one of these things that we do, each one of these commands we've talked about, pull, um, uh, add, list, whatever, they're just classes. Right? And you can make new classes and plug them into Pinto. Uh, so, so in theory, you, you can do all sorts of things, like maybe you could create a command to search the repository, search all the distributions in the repository uh, with ACK or something like that. Um, you want to find a particular string of source code across a whole bunch of, of tarballs. Or, or maybe you want to, uh, oh, what else? Uh, or maybe you want to just look inside one of the tarballs something similar to like the CPAN look command. Uh, future plans, coming back to Jan's question. Pinto is, is kind of becoming like a VCS, and I think the next logical step is to support some kind of rollback. So each one of these commands is basically like a transaction or a commit, and I want to be able to show you the diff between uh, one state of the repository and another, and when you find out that you know, you've upgraded something that broke your application, because sometimes you, you may not find out about the breakage until long after you, you've upgraded. Right? It might come to you in the form of a bug report rather than just, just a, a, a test failure from your continuous integration system. So I'd, I'd like to, to enable Pinto to, to roll back to a previous state and, and show you logs and diffs and things like that. Uh, I'd also, uh, this, is, this is more for uh, Ricardo, but I'd like to be able to report the upstream impacts of an upgrade. So let's say we've upgraded URI. A reasonable thing to want to know is, well, what depends on URI? What might I need to test to make sure that they are, it's all still compatible with the new URI? Pinto keeps track of dependencies. Uh, so this information is inside of it, but I just haven't written the, written the commands to, to unwind it and figure out what to do with it. Another thing that you could do with that is you could verify that you ha that a stack actually contains sufficient modules 
to satisfy all the dependencies. It's possible to create a stack that doesn't have enough stuff to actually deploy your application. So if you keep track of it, if, if we look at the dependency tree um, that, that Pinto maintains, you should be able to figure that out. Uh, another sort of eye candy thing would be to be able to visualize dependencies. Uh, and it's not particularly fast, but I think that's mostly because I'm uh, not very good with DBIX class. Uh, get it today on, uh, on CPAN or fork me on GitHub. Uh, any questions? In the front. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question about polling. Um, does, is Pinto aware of backhand? Can it pull stuff out of backhand automatically? Right. So this, the question is, can you pull from backpan? Um, Pinto will pull from anything that looks like a CPAN repository. So uh, Pinto can pull from other Pinto repositories. Um, that's where the whole Pinto network idea comes from. Uh, you can you can certainly point Pinto at Backpan. I don't know what the state of the index of Backpan is. Okay, so in that case, you, you would have to specify. Whenever you pull something, you can either you can specify two ways. You can either say, "Give me URI," in which case it has to go look at an index to figure out what distribution that's in, or you can say, "Give me Giesel's distribution slash gas." Or, I'm sorry, um, URI dash 1.06. Dot tar dot gz. Same way that the CPAN utility works, if you specify a precise distribution, it will go fetch that. Um, and yes, so if you point it at backpan, you can go and get older, older stuff. Ricardo. When, when you pin, can you provide a reason so that the next guy can see why you said no? Um, at present, no. But when I, the, my, my intent is that when it sort of reaches this VCS uh, type uh, when, when it becomes more VCS-like, every transaction basically gets a log message. So when you do a pin, you enter a log message that says, I'm pinning this because whatever your reason is. So the question is, what, what happens if... Okay, so the U is actually whatever your username is, um, not, not Y-O-U. So it defaults to your shell username, or you can actually set an option, or if you have a .pause file in your home directory, it'll look there. Um, so if you're a pause author, you might have actually some of your pause modules in your Pinto repository, and you'll have some of the, own, the private stuff that you've, you've locally authored in there as well. And it's, you can only have, just like pause, you, you can only have one version of, you, you can only upload the file once. So if you have foo 1.0 tar gz from, that you authored on CPAN, you're not going to be able to put foo 1.0 tar gz uh, into your Pinto repository. They all have to live on the, there's only one namespace uh, on the file system, so they all have to live together. Jonathan. Right. So the question is, do you, if, you were, if you were to use Pinto as a deployment vehicle, um, would your development and production servers both have to have, be visible? Or would, would the Pinto repository have to be visible from both places? Um, the answer is yes, if you're going to go directly to the repository to do this. What I imagine what you could do is you might have a, a development and a staging area, which is which are both, which can both reach Pinto, uh, the Pinto repository. And then when you bless the staging area, then, you know, you are sync it over to what your, whatever your actual production is. So that you have one layer, one more layer of separation there. Uh, if you're, if you're really paranoid about 
keeping production and development resources isolated. I'm not sure I understand that. It, uh, expect scripting. Ah. So um, when it comes to installing, uh, Pinto, the Pinto's install mechanism is basically a wrapper around CPAN-M. Um, and CPAN-M sets some options, basically tells the, tells the distribution that you're in an automated environment, you're not allowed to ask any questions. Um, that seems to have worked out pretty well. Um, but if that doesn't work for you, let's say you have a distribution like um, DBI Oracle, uh, for example, asks you for like a, a database name and a password, otherwise you can't install it. So what p folks do is they use the distro prefs feature of CPAN, which allows you to sort of uh, pre-configure what the answers to those questions are. Uh, and so instead of using Pinto's install mechanism, in that case, you would have to use CPAN and it's just distro prefs. Uh, question, is the install order stable? Uh, I don't know. Uh, it installs things in whatever order CPAN or CPAN-M would install them. And if those are stable, then so is Pinto. Right. The question is, is, is a pull transactional? And yes, every command is entirely atomic. So if, if you, it, you know, and some of these transactions can be really long, you know, in a pulling catalyst or a task catalyst, let's say, into your repository, um, there, there's, there's probably uh, 50 or 100 distributions that it has to pull in. And if on the 99th one, it says, wait a minute, I'm not allowed to have this because you've pinned it then the whole thing aborts and it goes back to zero. Yes? What sounds of dependencies? Ah. So, um, it's from, so determining dependencies. This is a little bit, little bit nasty, but we actually configure the build. So, um, you know, we, we run the make maker or the module build script and then inspect whatever meta files come out of that, which, um, you usually declare the dependencies. Um, so this is not exactly, this is not 100% safe, right? Um, but then again, we're not doing anything that CPAN or cpan -ab wouldn't be doing for you when you install this stuff anyway. That is true. That is true. So, see, so when, you, when, you, when you do that, right, you're, you're, you're configuring the build in one context. That may not actually be the context that you want to deploy in. This is another use case for stacks. Um, this feature isn't supported yet, but you could associate a particular Perl uh, with, with a stack, and so that all the configuration is done with a particular Perl executable. Now, that's not the same thing as doing it on a different machine, um, but you might be running Perl, you might be running your Pinto repository with Perl 5.16, but your deployment environment is actually you know, 5.8. So when you do the configure, you want to be using 5.8. So that, that's in the, in the wish list. We're running out of time. One more question. Is there any case of a curl based install? Curl based install. Oh, there's no chance. Um, there, there's this enormous wad of dependencies uh, that go with it. And I, I guess you could fat pack the whole thing. I, I don't know. That doesn't, that doesn't seem feasible. All right, thanks, everybody.